Good evening, everybody. Hi, how y'all doing? Welcome to the Westminster Town Hall Forum. Yeah, very exciting. So, uh, my name is Tane Danger. I am the director of the forum. I'm up here. Uh, tonight's a little special. As some of you might know, uh, our moderator, Tim Hart Anderson, this is his final forum this evening. And so actually at 5.30, he's going to come up here and he is going to share a little bit of his uh, reflections and memories from more than 25 or 24 years uh, moderating the town hall forum. Uh, so I, I'm giving you all a little bit of a heads up on that, that our, part of our program with that is going to start a little early at 5.30 and it's going to be it's going to be something special. You're, I, I will just say, I think that we are all very lucky to be here for that. Um, there, I will also say, because I don't, Tim's not in here right now, right? So we have a book for Tim. We have a memory book for Tim that will be outside at Breads and Spreads. And so please, if you uh, appreciate Tim, as I think almost everyone in this room certainly does, please take a moment to like write a memory, something that is meaningful uh, to you, or even to just wish Tim a, a happy retirement in that book before you leave tonight. It'll be out there. But with that, I promised these folks that I would do a very quick, brief introduction, and I'm ruining it already. Uh, we are going to start with music, and I'm very excited. Monroe Crossing, uh, they are an electrifying blend of bluegrass, and they are... Uh, I love these guys. Uh, I've had the great pleasure of being in the building as they've been practicing all day today. Uh, they've been together for more than 20 years, all over the United States, Canada, and Europe. In 2007, they were inducted into the Minnesota Music Hall of Fame, so please, everyone, a big round of applause for Monroe Crossing.
Crossing Bluegrass Band. We essentially play bluegrass with Scandinavian attitude, or atti or, uh, <laughs> attitude, I guess. But uh, and we've uh, we've been playing for 20 really good O's, yes, too. Oh, sure. But we've been playing all over Minnesota and all across the country. The one of the few towns we haven't played in Minnesota is a town called Bluegrass. So if any of you are from Bluegrass, see if you can get us a booking there. We'd love to, to play there sometime. But we did add. A 48th state that we did Maine earlier this year, and we learned how to say, yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. Is that the restaurant down the street? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> well, anyways, we got some new songs here. Uh, this is one that Lisa wrote, and I'll let her tell you all about it. Well, you know, Mark and I are married, and we have twins, and uh, those of you who have seen this over the years uh, might be shocked to know they are now 21 years old. <laughs> I know, I know. That's my reaction, too. And I was um, hanging in the hammock with our dog one day, and this melody popped into my mind. And so I put some words that put my hopes and dreams for their future in it. And, um, and ironic, unironically, I'm calling this hammock dog.
tree-lined path The dipsy rises up to interest your journey And you decide which way you'll go A world thorough and frost illumined in the writing Time and turn, pets alone, gather up the day see the darker side of her songwriting and a song called Me and Billy about a couple of boys who grew up in the backyard playing cops and robbers and when they grew up one became a cop and the other I'm not going to give it away. I have to wait to the end and listen to the words but the chorus goes the Jesse James gang ain't got a thing on me. Me and Billy. Well, 
case you're wondering, we are named Monroe Crossing after Bill Monroe, the father of bluegrass music. Bill and his bluegrass boys started this music back in 1946, and we all met because of bluegrass, so we had a Monroe Crossing. At least that's the story we're sticking with. Well, this next song is a little bit lighter, too. And it was um, written in Minnesota after we attended a church up outside of Duluth, and we saw this inscribed in a wall hanging, and Mark and I spent the afternoon writing this. We hope you enjoy it. It's called Micah 6-8. during the COVID shutdown, we were uh, out of work, sitting at home, wondering what to do. I got down to the basement and put, put an album together and uh, put a bunch of original songs and some covers on there. Had 19 different guest musicians join me from around the state of Minnesota and Wisconsin. And I just threw it all on the computer, hit the make CD button, and a CD popped out. It was great. <laughs> Anyone can do it these days. Hey, this was written during COVID, so it's a little darker tune. It's called Hard Life. It's a hard life doing what you do. It's a hard life trying to make it through. It's a hard life. Well, it's sad, but it's true. It's a hard life, but I'm glad I'm living it with you. When the bad news comes to town, it turns your whole world upside down. There is nothing you can say. Them troubled times away Cause it's a hard life Doing what you do It's a hard life Trying to make it through It's a hard life Well it's sad but it's true It's a hard life But I'm glad I'm living it with you All that 
spin and knocks you down For a while it goes away To come around another day Cause it's a hard life Doing what you do It's a hard life Trying to make it through It's a hard life Well it's sad but it's true It's a hard life But I'm glad I made it with you Like there ain't no quiet ground Cover your ears, scream away I'll join you on the ricochet Cause it's a hard life Doing what you do It's a hard life Trying to make it through It's a hard life Well it's sad, but it's true It's a hard life But I'm glad I'm living it with you Oh, it's a hard life original uh, numbers on this uh, set, but this next song was not written by one of us. It was written by our friend Mr. Bill Isles from Duluth, Minnesota. Uh, he wrote this song in honor of his grandfather, who immigrated from Germany in about the time of the Great Depression, was working as a train mechanic in a roundhouse, working the overnight shifts up in Virginia, Minnesota. And he, uh, he took pity on the guys who were riding the rails looking for work. And on the middle of those cold Minnesota winter nights, he would let them come in uh, to the roundhouse, maybe get a little warmth, a little sleep. Uh, but there was another guy who had a job on the train yard, and that was to keep all the hobos out. So he brought those guys in to warm up, despite the fact that if he had gotten caught, he could have lost his job. It's a beautiful tune called Hobos in the Roundhouse. From seven to seven, Every night of the week Fixing trains in the roundhouse I work on my feet And I told my children Hope the bed bugs don't bite Cause I got hobos sleeping In the roundhouse tonight From Akron to Hinkley and Prairie du Chien. They are soldiers and lawyers and I believe what they're saying. And I'll rouse them at four to head down the line. The hobos are sleeping in the roundhouse tonight. Good night, my hobos. Rest your vagabond head. Sack pillows in your gunny 
job could be through. Well, I heard the answer so clear and so bright. Are my hobos sleep in your roundhouse tonight? Good night, my hobos. Rest your vagabond head. On the bass, Mark Anderson. On the guitar, Derek Johnson. On the mandolin, Matt Thompson. And have, you, have you noticed the Minnesota theme so far? Anderson, Johnson, Thompson. And then we have, uh, he kind of ruined it over here, on the banjo, Graham Sones. Sones song. Now, this is a Norwegian name. Yeah. Yes, very Norwegian. On the fiddle, at least a few glee. <laughs> All right, we're going to close it out with a speedy tune called Bullet Train. Thank you. One, two, three, four, one, two. <laughs>
Thank you, everybody. Yeah, it was pretty great. One more time, Monroe Crossing, everybody. Oh, wow. That was, wow. That's, uh, that is fantastic. Hello again, everybody. I am so happy to see all of you here. Once again, my name is Tane Danger. I am the director of the Westminster Town Hall Forum. Thank you all for being here tonight. This is our program with National Public Radio's Steve Inskeep, the author of this fabulous new book that we're gonna hear all about, Differ We Must. But tonight is special because tonight is also a, uh, a last night for the Westminster Town Hall Forum's long time moderator. For more than 24 years, Tim Hart Anderson has both been the senior minister here at Westminster and the voice and the face and the presence holding every Westminster Town Hall Forum together. He is retiring at the end of October, and so this uh, being our October forum is his final time with us here at the forum. And so we've asked him to step out of his usual moderator role where he normally just asks the questions to come up here and share some of his memories and reflections of almost a quarter century hosting some of the most important voices in the country right here at Westminster. So, without further ado, please welcome the moderator of the Westminster Town Hall Forum, Tim Hart Anderson. Just like another Sunday morning at Westminster. <laughs> if only. Uh, has Tane left the room yet? No, no, no. Okay, and I want to thank Tane. He's done a great job in his time as our director, just outstanding work, and I really enjoyed working with you, Tane. So let's thank Tane for his good work. <laughs> now, Tane told me I had 30 minutes which is a lot longer than I get on Sunday morning at Westminster. Although maybe we could, in these last few weeks, make a few changes that way. Uh, it's been a really good experience for me to serve as the moderator of the forum, and preparing for these remarks has been a delight. Uh, if you don't know it, uh, the Westminster Tunnel Forum website has uh, archived every single speaker that's been here. And it's a fascinating way to spend uh, a good chunk of your life, <laughs> as I have done in the last, last little bit here. Uh, and uh, I'm pleased to kind of think with you a little bit about this, tell some stories, some anecdotes, what's gone on behind the scenes that you haven't seen that I'll tell you about, uh, and just give some uh, thoughts about, about why the forum is so important. I want to know if any of you were here on September 18, 1980, when our first forum was held, Archibald Cox was the speaker. Saturday Night Massacre, remember that? Uh, when he was fired by Nixon. So show of hands, was anybody here in September of 1980? Nancy, you must have been here because your dad started it. Nancy, <laughs> Nancy Meisel, started by her father, Don Meisel, my predecessor. Since then, 350 speakers have been here to speak at the Westminster Town Hall Forum. The church started this program as a way for our congregation to make a positive contribution to the common good. We didn't want to keep our message inside these walls. We wanted to invite people in and hopefully carry the message out that we can live together constructively and across that which divides us, which we're going to hear about from Steve Inskeep in just a few minutes. We wanted to invite the conversation of the community to focus around key issues from an ethical perspective. Welcome to the Westminster Town Hall Forum. So uh, 
but this is actually very much part of our tradition as Presbyterians. We, we, we think of our faith as something to carry out into the public square. We want to play a role with what's going on in the community. We want to make a difference in the community. We want to make a difference in the, in the global scene. So it's, it was perfectly natural that a Presbyterian congregation in a downtown community like this would offer the community an opportunity to have good conversations. And we've been doing that now for 43 years, and it's as strong as ever. Our, our religious conviction says this is the stuff we need to do. We don't just keep it confined in here. We, we look at the issues of the world, and sometimes you get into trouble when you do that, and you're going to hear from Steve Inskeep. He's going to talk about uh, the, the Lovejoy brothers. Elijah Lovejoy was a Presbyterian minister, a rabid abolitionist who was killed by a pro-slavery mob in 1834, I think, in Alton, Illinois. Uh, one of those conversation partners with President Lincoln that we're going to hear about, the Lovejoys. Presbyterians getting into good trouble, and this is a way we have try to channel the good trouble constructively. So the, the potential impact of the forum really got my attention. While I was in San Francisco looking for, well, actually we weren't looking for a new call, were we? The call came looking for us, but when I was looking at the position, there, was a number, there were a number of things that attracted me, and one of them was this thing called the Westminster Town Hall Forum. As a Presbyterian pastor, I wanted to be in a church that was concerned with issues in the community. It attracted me, and I imagine it will attract my successor, too, to be involved in a church like this with a conversation like with the ones we have at the forum. Today, more than ever, I think, it's obvious why the mission of the Westminster Town Hall Forum is so important. We are so divided, so fractured, so not talking to one another, so not listening to one another. This is a time for us to practice that good human uh, effort to be in community and listen. And that's what you're going to hear from Steve Inskeep, and it's what we're all about at the forum. When I came here, the McKnight Foundation was the, really about the only funder of the forum. There weren't individual donors. There was a McKnight Foundation. They'd been supporting the forum for many years, a, a big hefty, I think it was 50000 a year. And about a year into my tenure here, they informed us they were going to reduce that by a certain amount each year for two or three years, and we were going to be on our own then. And that was a little frightening, but we, it actually was a good exercise. It forced us to say to those who listen to the forum, come help us keep this conversation going and participate in, in funding the forum. And you all have done that really well, and I would be remiss if I were out here and talking to you, and try, I, I don't want to protect you from your own generosity. <laughs> so which I tell our congregation all the time, but we're a forum that is having lively, important conversations, mostly because of you all. Lots of, hundreds and hundreds of supporters, and we, I hope you're a supporter, and if you're not, tonight's an, a night, good night to start. You can get your phone out while I'm talking, and, or maybe do that when Mr. Inskeep is talking. <laughs> and so my first forum was uh, in March of 2000, and the first forum speaker I, hosted was a woman named Sylvia Earle. Uh, she then was 65, she's now 88, and she is known as, uh, she's an oceanographer and uh, environmentalist, very concerned about the water on the planet, and she's known as her deepness. She's been, because she's dived, she's been the, she made the deepest solo untethered dive of anybody on the planet ever. 1,250 feet below sea, untethered in a special suit, alone. Can you imagine that? Uh, it was, I thought, oh my gosh, are all these speakers like this? Uh, she was a diminutive, but a real powerhouse, and a, just a joy to be, to be with, and uh, some called her the Sturgeon General. She's, uh, <laughs> she was named the first hero of the earth by Time Magazine. She was a, an environmentalist, and that became kind of a, an emerging theme that we'll hear more about uh, as I describe what, what we've gone through in the last uh, 24 years together. So I discovered that year, in the year 2000, that the Town Hall Forum has kind of a, a knack, a penchant, for having a speaker at just the right time for what's going on in, in the context of the world around us. And that fall, November 2000, presidential election, you remember that? It was Gore and Bush, November 7th. And we had a forum on November 9th, and we had invited this person, David Gergen, to come speak about the results of the election. 
Well, there was no result of the election. Remember that? Uh, it was, the, remember the hanging chads and all that? Uh, and it was actually some weeks before the election was decided, so it was a timely visit by a person who had served in both Republican and uh, Democrat administrations, David Gergen, a, a very smart and uh, wise person. Uh, and he, he spoke about things then, this is 23 years ago this fall, spoke about things then that sound really familiar to us today, nearly a quarter century later. And I thought you might like to hear uh, how he described our nation and the politics of America a quarter century ago. We've got a little bit of tape here to play for you. When it's this closely divided, something we haven't seen since the late 19th century, then you have enormous friction in our politics. In the late 19th century, which was similar in the same way, the parties clawed at each other regularly. It was a, it was a mean, dispiriting time in our politics. A lot of good people didn't go into politics that time. Is that not prescient for what we're facing today? A lot of good people aren't going into politics in our time. And the divide is even worse today than it was back then. Uh, in fact, when you think about that election and how it was settled, it was kind of a genteel uh, agreement to say, okay, it's done and we're going to live with the result. Uh, so Gergen was talking about an America back then, and that's even more so the America today. And it's exactly why we need to have these kinds of civic conversations in our community. David Gergen was only one of many Davids that we've had over the years. We've had uh, David Gergen, David McCullough, David Halberstam, uh, who was with us just a few months before he was killed in a tra tragic auto accident. David Hogg, a survivor of the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas uh, uh, high school shooting just a few months after he had survived that. David Rockefeller, David Eisenhower, David Brooks, David Brooks, David Brooks. <laughs> he, we've had two speakers three times, and David Brooks is one of those. Uh, and we knew it would be a big deal when he showed up that first time, and it was a big deal. This is before we redid our, our, our building, so we didn't have the capacity we have now, but this room was packed. I remember having to ask people to do the Minnesota squeeze, which was really hard for everybody, uh, but we made a little more space, and the fire department was uh, summoned because they were concerned about people sitting in the aisles, and we had the choir. That, you know, we, I, I like to say anybody sitting up there is the choir, and I have yet to hear a good anthem from them. But uh, it was packed, and every room in that we could fill in, the, in our building was packed. We think about 3,000 people were here that day. And the same number the second time, the same number the third time. And he came back the second time. The first thing he said in his remarks, I tell my publishers that when I publish a book, the first place I want to go is the Westminster Town Hall Forum. <laughs> There's not a better place to talk about the issues that I want to talk about than this place. And uh, I was so pleased to hear that, and I uh, should have played that tape for you, but um, <laughs> it was uh, 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 an indication that uh, the conversations we're having are national in scope. We have always tried to have national issues, national speakers, not local so much, but national. And uh, his comments reminded me of what we're doing here matters across the country. You want to guess who the only other person is that we've had three times? Mondale, of course, Mondale. Uh, his first time with us was just a few weeks after September 11th, 2001. We needed, uh, I guess we needed to hear someone like Fritz. He and I walked in here and the congregation, I mean audience, rose to its feet, the place was packed, and they would not stop clapping. Some of you may have been here. It was about a, I don't know, four or five minute ovation for Fritz Mondale. Partly, I think, expressing our appreciation for him. This was the year before Wellstone was killed and he ran, but our appreciation for him and our need to have in our presence somebody who understood what America's all about in a Minnesota way and Fritz Mondale. So he was, a, 
here two more times after that. Gary Eichten interviewed him once, and, and he did a presentation on his own once. Over these years that I've been here, the topics have varied. We've been all over the map, especially in the early years that I was here. We would kind of go to this topic, and the next forum be at that topic, and the next one would be at that topic. And it wasn't really a th much of a thematic connection. One week, or one forum would be on hunger in America. The next one would be on gangs in Los Angeles. The next one on the power of music. The next one on the future of faith in Israel and Palestine, which could be a conversation tonight. Uh, mental illness, literature, the economy, we were kind of all over the map, but over these years we've started to kind of gravitate towards certain topics that are thematic. And there won't be any surprise to you if you're a regular forum attender. Stewardship of the earth, environmental concerns, that first forum that I did was about stewardship of the waters of the earth. Racial justice has become a really key theme for us, gun violence and trying to stop gun violence, especially with children, and the state of American politics. We've gone back and back and back to that topic, the state of American culture, and that's the topic for tonight. But to illustrate this thematic arc and the kind of change in the forum over these years, Marion Wright Edelman spoke here first in 1986, and her topic in 86 was on the challenge of teen pregnancy. She came 20 years later in 2006, and instead she talked about racial justice and gun violence and its impact on children. Here's what she had to say. We worry and speak out and have anti-war movements, Vietnam and Iraq. We have lost almost 100,000 children to gunfire since 1979, when we began to, make, to, to, to keep gun figures by age. That's twice as many as the American battle casualties in Vietnam, but where is our anti-war movement and protection movement for our children? It's time to stop the killing of children from firearms in America. Yeah. You now that was 17 years ago, and since then it's only gotten worse. In fact, just this week, a report from the American Academy of Pediatrics cites gun violence as the leading cause of death for American children. So her clarion call for a stop to gun violence with kids is yet, has yet to be heard. The COVID pandemic was uh, a, a time of a uh, little throwing us for a loop at the forum, like it threw everybody for a loop, and uh, we ended up having to uh, kind of back off these sorts of presentations, and we kept going, though. We, we, we uh, had speakers and we made recordings of them, turned part of our uh, church library into a studio. And by the way, let's give a shout out to our tech team, Keith Kopatz and others. They did such a good job with us. I remember what the first conversation we had uh, was with Eddie Gloud on James Baldwin uh, and race in America and something about being on a Zoom call one-to-one -one, as he and I were with nobody else around. There was no audience. It was a recording. Keith was the audience. And uh, we had a lot of uh, chit-chat before we got into the topic. And it was one of the, I would say, one of the most gracious uh, one of the kindest conversations I've had as a forum moderator with Eddie Gloud, the author on James Baldwin. We were both kind of hurting and reeling from the pandemic and the isolation, and we had a, a really sweet conversation, and he did a great job in the forum that day. The other forum we did by recording was kind of humorous, Bill McKibben, another environmentalist, uh, his second time at the forum, we contacted him, and of course, you're trying to get on a laptop, and we're on a laptop in our studio. He's in a house in the woods in Vermont with a lousy connection, and he's in and out, in and out, yeah, in and out, and, and we're watching him on his laptop screen as he's climbing around the house trying to find the best connection. And he finally gets all the way up into the attic and leans toward a window in the attic and the connection was good, so we did the forum there. And then I realized that he, his arm was in a sling. He had a broken arm all this time trying to climb around, but he did a great forum in his attic near the window where the connection was good. 
And then finally, uh, we had, uh, some of you may remember this, uh, Walter Isaacson spoke. He's an author of a study, a biographical study of a woman named Jennifer Doudna, who, you know, we never heard of her. In fact, when we selected this, we're all going, this is a little technical. It's about RNA and, and how you kind of work through uh, the chemistry and the medicine to get to a vaccine. And that was the woman whose research team developed the vaccine for COVID, and she was the subject of Isaacson's book right about a month or two before, after the COVID vaccine had come out. Again, timely, a timely speaker in the Westminster Town Hall Forum. We, like the rest of Minneapolis, Minnesota, and of course the nation have been dealing with racial injustice in our world, and it hit us particularly vividly in, in May of 2020 after COVID had started with the police murder of George Floyd right here, just not far from where we are now. And that became an important theme for the Town Hall Forum. And we've partnered now with the Minneapolis Foundation for three years, 21, 22, and 23, every May, a forum series called The Arc Toward Justice. And we're gonna continue doing that because the conversation is long and important uh, in our city and in our nation. We've had Jelani Cobb, uh, Michelle Norris, Cornell West, and others here to help us understand how we might uh, change that arc in our nation. So, what goes on behind the scenes? Uh, the forum speaker usually gets here about 45 minutes before the, the program starts. They have some pictures taken, and they go up to my office, and this is kind of the most, one of the most fun parts of my job. I get to sit in my office for 45 minutes or so and visit with these really interesting people. And, uh, uh, one of them, his name was Frederick Luskin. He's a, a He's at the Institute of Transpersonal Psychology in San Francisco, of course. And <laughs> I moved here from San Francisco, so I'm aware of these things. His book was Stress Free for Good. And about 10 minutes before we were to come down, we're up in my office, he says, would you mind if I stood on my head? The only forum speaker who has ever asked that of me. I said, go right ahead. And so I watched as he stood on his head for about five minutes in my office. And, and I said, you got good blood down there? He said, yeah, I think I'm ready. So he came down and, and, and he was really pumped up to, for that. <laughs> Some of you know the name Morris Dees. Uh, Morris Dees was the director of the uh, Southern Poverty Law Center based in Montgomery, Alabama. Uh, more, he's no longer there, but he spoke here. Uh, it was 2001, February of 2001. And in my office, before we came down, he said, I, sh I should tell you this, that uh, you go up on the stage, the chancel, the stage, and introduce me, and then get off. Because if something happens, I don't want you to get hurt. The Southern Poverty Law Center's thing is uh, going after white supremacist, white nationalist, violent groups across America. They attack them by suing them, by going at them financially, and they bankrupt them and they put them out of business. And he said, Minnesota is full of well-armed militia members who, are, who have been threatening me as I come here. So we had 20 security officers in the audience that day. 10 of them were in uniform, Minneapolis police, and 10 were the guys with short hairs and things in their ears that were stuck out like the people in uniforms. Uh, so I came out, introduced him, and I got the heck out of there, and he gave his presentation and uh, did a good job, and nothing, nothing happened. Then there was Branford Marsalis. Anybody remember Branford Marsalis? Yeah, the great jazz player. Uh, he, he, the, the week prior to coming, he was on jury duty. And it just, as jury duty can do, it's an important civic responsibility, and it kind of throws you. And so he was thrown off, didn't have time to write his speech. He got to his hotel across the street the night before, and, and he was uh, up at 4 in the morning writing his speech and got it all ready, printed it out, came over here, and got up here and opened up his speech, and all the pages were blank. <laughs> and he... he, he and we're live on the radio, and he says, well, I'll do what I do best, I'll improvise. <laughs> and then he said to me, go to the hotel and get the laptop. So, <laughs> uh, 
Uh, he started improvising, just kind of uh, riffing on what he thought he was going to say. And we ran across to the hotel. I jetted off the stage and we got his laptop. About 10 minutes into his talk, I walked up and he opened his laptop and and literally kind of mid-sentence, actually repeated the sentence about three times, three times, and then he got it, and away he went. That's the first time we've ever had someone uh, have trouble with their, with their notes. Some people get up and speak without notes, and it's amazing to watch them do that. Liz Winstead. <laughs> Were some of you here that night, that day? Yeah. She's a stand-up comic, the first one we've had, I think, and uh, nice conversation with her in my office, and she said, are you familiar with my work? And I said, well, n no. <laughs> Usually I am. I bone up on the speaker, as I have done tonight, but I figured a stand-up comic, how can you get familiar? She says, well, sometimes my language gets a little rough. I said, what do you mean? She says, well, sometimes I drop the F-bomb. And I said, oh. <laughs> I'm not sure that's ever happened uh, at Westminster. So we came out and she dropped the F-bomb. <laughs> and turned around and apologized to me, then kept going. I think she may have dropped two of them. That's the, <laughs> that's the only thing I remember about Liz Winstead's talk. <laughs> So Al Gore, Al Gore came here in uh, not too long ago, 20, uh, 10 years ago, 2013. And I don't know how he did this, but you remember the restaurant Vincent that used to be on the corner of 11th and the mall, lovely restaurant. Uh, my door to my office opens and in walks Vice President Gore and behind him is Vincent the chef <laughs> carrying two plates two Vincent burgers. And I'm at my desk and the, Al Gore looks at me and says, why don't you sit over there? I'll sit here and eat. And uh, so he put the two plates down and sat down and started eating. Uh, he got through one burger and that's when Fritz Mondale showed up. He a member of our church. I had invited him to come meet. I wanted to hear two vice presidents talk. And, and uh, so he left the other burger there. After the program, I went up and ate it. And it was fascinating to hear these two former vice presidents uh, commiserate, really, about what was going on in the Senate and in Congress, and this is 10 years ago. And they talked, uh, shared a lot of intimate memories about people on the other side of the aisle and their friendships and having drinks at the end of the day and arguing uh, you know, about bills and policies and then going out to dinner together and their families hanging out together. And they were bemoaning the fact that that's not how it is today, and uh, I think we all can agree with that. Uh, so Gore came out here, and he was quite uh, astonished at the turnout. It, the place was packed, and, and here's, here's what he said about the Westminster Town Hall Forum. Ladies and gentlemen, what a, a pure joy it is to be here in this beautiful sanctuary and to be able to spend some time with you. I've been looking forward to this, and. Uh, I welcome those in the two overflow rooms uh, here and uh, those listening on Minnesota Public Radio. Uh, the Westminster Town Hall Forum is proof positive that in Minnesota at least, democracy is alive and well with a well-informed citizenry. Once again, the value of the Westminster Town Hall Forum, free and open to the public, with good music beforehand and wonderful breads and spreads afterwards. A shout out to Starla Krause. There she is. Thank you for that, Starla. This is how democracy works. You listen to music, you hear a good speaker, you talk together, you eat together, and you build community. People sometimes say, what was the best speaker that you, that you hosted at the forum? And that's really hard really hard to answer. David Hogg, the youngest speaker ever, 19 years old, been, survived the um, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas shooting. Uh, he was really powerful, not a note in his hand, very powerful. Uh, Eric Holder, not too long ago, we had a great conversation here, I really enjoyed that. Sister Simone Campbell, uh, the, she was uh, the author of Nuns on the Bus, 
a kind of an activist group, really enjoyed her. Ari Shapiro was fabulous. Some of you were here for him. Barbara Brown Taylor did a really good job here. But for me, among the most memorable speakers was Brian Stevenson. Some of you may remember him. He's the author of Just Mercy, movie about him, about that book, Just Mercy. He's a public interest lawyer in Montgomery, Alabama, started the Equal Justice Initiative. And uh, it's a, he's got a wonderful, um, um, it's like a museum, I guess, but it's, it's, you've, you've heard of the, uh, what's it called, the Peace and Justice Memorial, where it's about lynching, the lynching memorials. That's his project, uh, recording for posterity, every lynching that happened across the country. Fabulous work, very moving work, uh, racism and criminal justice. Here's a snippet of what he said. He was describing how how the people he works with are so broken by racism, broken by criminal justice, broken by, by poverty, and what keeps him going in his work. And I realized something I hadn't realized before. I realized uh, why I do this work. And I realized that I don't do it because I have to. I don't do it because somebody has to do it. I don't do it because I've been trained to do it. I don't do it because it's important. I don't do it because I get to talk to wonderful people like you. I realized that night that I don't do what I do for the money. There's no money. I don't do what I do because there's an opportunity to make things better. I realized that night that I do what I do because I'm broken too. And the truth of it is that when you choose to do uncomfortable things, there will be these moments where there's a little cut, there's a little bruise, there's a little injury. It will make you uncomfortable in ways that create cracks and injuries. But I also realize that in brokenness, you become connected to your humanity. I believe broken people are the only people that will create justice in this society because they accept and understand what the needs of mercy are. You cannot be compassionate until you need compassion. You cannot be merciful until you need mercy. And I am persuaded that when you get uncomfortable, you appreciate things you cannot appreciate otherwise. I believe that each of us is more than the worst thing we've ever done. That's what my clients have taught me. Each of us, each of us is more than the worst thing we've ever done. The conversations that we have here in the forum are bright spots in a world that sometimes seems suffused with shadows. And oftentimes, in fact, almost every speaker starts their talk by describing something that is not right in our nation or in our city or in our world. And then they go on eventually to propose a constructive way forward. We may not agree with the way forward, but they move us toward a next constructive step. And it's been my practice, and I'll try it tonight, watch it. Inskeep doesn't know this, but the last question, the last question I always ask is, are you hopeful? Are you hopeful about whatever the issue is? And I want to hear if Steve Inskeep is hopeful about American politics. Yes. <laughs> oh, there he is, okay. I'm still gonna ask you the question. We need a little more, a little more color to it. So I, that's really what we're trying to do here is put some hope into the mix by these conversations. And one of the people who did that really effectively as a speaker was uh, Bernice Johnson Reagan, who founded Sweet Honey in the Rock, a singing group, and she spoke and she sang. And this is how she ended, how she ended her talk. There is a Thank you for showing up for the Westminster Town Hall Forum so we might bring a little hope into the community, into our world by these good conversations. It's been a great run for me. I've enjoyed every minute of it, and I'm going to enjoy tonight with Steve, Steve Inskeep. Thanks for being here.
So I see some people leaving, Steve. That's, uh, <laughs> don't take that personally. We are pleased tonight to welcome Steve Inskeep to the Westminster Town Hall Forum. For more than 40 years, the Westminster Town Hall Forum has invited speakers of conscience to address issues of the day from an ethical perspective. Tonight is the second in our fall season at the Town Hall Forum. We've asked four award-winning speakers to each share a different American story. On November 9th, Nancy Giles of CBS Sunday Morning will speak. She'll talk about how marginalized communities in America have used humor to overcome adversity and tell their own stories. And then finally, on December 7th, the forum welcomes Raquel Willis, co-founder of the Transgender Week of Visibility. She'll share some of the story from her new memoir, The Risk It Takes to Bloom, on life and liberation. All these programs, as I mentioned earlier, are made possible by individual supporters like you. Individual donors are what make these programs happen. We occasionally get large grants from foundations or corporations, but it's the individual donors that bring us stability year after year. Please, if you would, make a forum gift tonight, either with the envelope in your program as you exit, or you can donate online or set up, especially like this, recurring monthly donations on our website, westminsterforum.org donate. Thanks, as always, to Minnesota Public Radio for recording and broadcasting all of our forums. NPR is presenting the Town Hall Forum's fall season as a special week of programs, December 11th, every day at noon. One program will air that week, December 11th. You can always watch or listen to our programs live on the Town Hall Forum website or Facebook page. They're also available as a podcast. Just search Westminster Town Hall Forum wherever you download your podcasts. And thanks again to our media co-sponsors, MinPost, a nonprofit community-supported newsroom and a trusted guide to the critical issues, challenges, and opportunities facing Minnesota. Sign up to receive their free coverage at minpost.com slash newsletters. And thanks also to Sahan Journal. Their mission is to provide reliable, high-quality journalism for immigrants and communities of color in Minnesota. Learn more about them at sahanjournal.com. And we're also excited to share that tonight's forum will be broadcast on KMOJ, the People Station. Tell folks that they can hear this program on KMOJ 89.9 FM in the Twin Cities next Sunday morning, next Sunday morning at 10 a.m. Let's see, you can come to the 8.30 service here <laughs> and then catch that. In the second half of today's program, Steve Inskeep will be taking questions from you all, the audience. Those of you in the sanctuary should find a blank question card to use to write a good question for Mr. Inskeep. And during the Q&A time after his opening presentation, we'll collect those and start asking as many as we can. If you're watching online, we welcome you to the forum and invite you to post a question in the chat feature. We will monitor that and try to get to your questions as well. And now it's my pleasure to introduce today's Westminster Town Hall Forum speaker. Steve Inskeep is a co-host of National Public Radio's Morning Edition, the most widely heard radio program in the United States. He also co-hosts NPR's Up First, one of the nation's most popular podcasts. Inskeep began at NPR covering the 1996 presidential primary in New Hampshire. No one else would do it, so he was sent to do it. <laughs> he went on to cover the Pentagon, the Senate, the 2000 presidential campaign of George W. Bush. He then covered the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. In 2003, he received a National Headliner Award for investigating a military raid gone bad in Afghanistan. And in just the past month, he's interviewed everyone from Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky to House Republicans, to members of the band called Talking Heads. He's the author of multiple books, and his latest out just this week is Differ We Must, How Lincoln Succeeded in a Divided America. It's been heralded as a deeply human look at one of the most written about figures in American history. 
Inskeep adeptly shows how Lincoln's mastery of politics adapted and evolved throughout his career. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, Steve Inskeep. Wow. Thank you. Thank you and good evening. Thank you for the introduction, Tim. I really appreciate that. And thank you for that warm welcome. I was a little humbled when I realized that this was going to be on the radio and that I'm supposed to speak for 25 minutes, just one person talking for 25 minutes in a row. And I had to give this little thought, like, who has ever sustained interest on the radio as just one person talking for 25 minutes from Minnesota? Who has ever done that? <laughs> and I couldn't quite remember the name, but I'm sure it would come to me if you'd give me a quiet week. <laughs> Some people got the latter part of that joke. <laughs> Not everybody, that's just fine. Um, it's really great to be here uh, and have this discussion. I do cover the news as a day job. There's a lot of grim news. On the day that we are talking, we're absorbing news of a new war in the Middle East between Israel and Hamas. Uh, just a week ago, the House Speaker, the Speaker of the House of Representatives, was deposed in a, in a vote. A lot of other things are going on in the country. And by the time that this is broadcast, perhaps we'll know how some of those stories have turned out and there may be new difficulties on the way. We have an opportunity though tonight to try to take the long view, which is what I try to do when I'm writing history, earlier versions in some cases of the stories that I cover today. And that is absolutely what I've tried to do with this biography of Abraham Lincoln. This is a man who is, in one way or another, in almost all of our heads. We all have an idea of Abraham Lincoln, in some cases more true than others. For example, some of you may know the story that Abraham Lincoln wrote his famous Gettysburg Address on the back of an envelope. Anybody heard that story before? Yes? Not true. There were several drafts on regular sheets of paper, and he wrote it. But in honor of the legend of the Gettysburg Address in the back of an envelope, I have chosen this evening <laughs> to make some notes of my speech on an envelope that I got from the Hyatt Regency across the street. <laughs> so I'm excited to be here. I want to get a few more facts about Lincoln on the table. I think it's a good idea to find out where an audience is on a topic. The very first talk that I gave about this book, I asked a group of high school students in Delaware to tell me facts about Abraham Lincoln, things they knew about Abraham Lincoln. And the answers from these 10th, 11th, 12th graders ranged from, he had a big hat, to he suspended the right of habeas corpus in 1861. That is the right to be able to face your accuser in court of law. I mean, just really remarkable a uh, bunch of facts from the basic to the really sophisticated. And so I want to just take a moment and do that now. Can a few people shout out to me just some fact or even a single word that you know about Abraham Lincoln? Anybody? I heard tall, Emancipation Proclamation, grew up poor. Couple more? Say, what? Rail splitter, that's a good one. From Kentucky. Wow, we're kind of... He lost several races, that's right. He, uh, he had a number of political failures before the fairly large big success. He was shot, rivals on his team, a reference to team of rivals, Doris Kearns Goodwin's history that talked about his cabinet and how there were other men in the cabinet who thought they should have been president instead of Lincoln. I'm sorry, couldn't hear that one? He was a father, thank you. Okay, we got to stop there, because you know so much. You've got the whole book, ladies and gentlemen. House divided cannot stand, one of his famous uh, lines from a famous speech. So we all have Abraham Lincoln in our heads, or nearly all of us do. And if there's somebody here who doesn't feel that they fit into that category, this talk is also for you. But a lot of us 
have Abraham Lincoln in our heads. So that does lead to the natural question which people always ask you when you write a book about Lincoln, why would you write the 18,000th book about Abraham Lincoln? And fortunately, Abraham Lincoln has a quote that speaks to this, which I wrote on the back of an envelope. Seriously wrote it on the back of an envelope. This is from not the Gettysburg Address, but his address at the Cooper Institute in 1860 when he was uh, emerging as a presidential hopeful and was invited to give a paid speech in New York City um, uh, to uh, a crowd there. For some reason, he didn't come to, to, to this forum. I guess it probably wasn't operating at that time. But he came to New York City, and he gave this strikingly, to me, the first time I read it, almost shockingly humble, self-effacing beginning to the speech. He's in New York City. He's in the big town. He's bought a brand new suit. He's in front of the city's elite. Some of them are already thinking about him as a presidential contender. This is a big, important speech. And he begins by seemingly downplaying anything that he has to say. Mr. President and fellow citizens, the facts with which I shall deal this evening are mainly old and familiar, nor is there anything new in the general use I shall make of them. If there shall be any novelty, it will be in the mode of presenting the facts and the inferences and observations following that presentation. Really, the first time I read this, like, man, sell yourself! <laughs> but. In researching this book, I went back to that speech and read it and read it again and again. And what Lincoln does in the speech is he talks about slavery. And he talks about the founding fathers and their view of slavery. And this is, for those who don't have it in their heads, it's 1860. Slavery is legal in almost half the states. It is the overwhelming debate, the overwhelming issue facing the country. What, if anything, to do about slavery? And Lincoln goes back to the founding fathers in this speech and demonstrates that the majority of the framers of the Constitution had, in one way or another, at one time or another, gone on the record against the spread of slavery. He was using the Founding Fathers to make a point for his argument. And I realized, by saying that all these facts are old and familiar, he was telling his audience and his critics, I am not radical to be against slavery. The founders of the country, most of them, spoke out in one way or another against slavery. He was taking his humility and using it as a tool to make a point. And it's in that kind of interaction with other people that I felt that I did learn something new about Abraham Lincoln, some things that I felt that I did not understand very well before. And they get to the question of how to deal with people who differ with you, people who disagree. I ended up structuring this biography such as to tell Lincoln's whole life story, or at least to attempt to. If you read, you'll determine that for yourselves. But I attempt to tell his whole life story through a series of meetings, 16 meetings, with people who differed with him, who came from a different race, a different background, a different social class, and above all, a different opinion. There are many disagreements in this book. And that was my effort to understand how Lincoln wrestled with a problem that many of us struggle with today. How to govern a divided America. How to talk to somebody at a divided Thanksgiving table. Anybody have that issue here, like relatives of different politics? How to manage our interactions with other people in a big, diverse country where there are going to be many disagreements. Now, I want to tell you about a few of these meetings, at least a little bit, but I also want to mention a few uh, overriding characteristics of Lincoln's political style. In addition to humility, which was kind of cleverly used, which we just talked about, he did a few other things that maybe not every leader does today. Abraham Lincoln did not demonize his opponents. He did not signal 
is virtue. He was arguing in a great moral cause, the greatest single moral question the United States has faced. He believed that slavery was a moral outrage, and yet he did not act morally superior to the people that he was criticizing. He didn't even ask his supporters to act morally superior to the other side. There's an occasion in 1854 in which he's speaking in the free state of Illinois to an audience that at least notionally is against slavery, although people had many opinions of it there. And he says that they should not feel superior to slave owners. In fact, he says, if we were in their position, we might do just as they do. And if they were in our position, they might do just as we do. He was arguing that people are shaped by their environment, that they are shaped by circumstances, and the proper goal in this case was to change the circumstances, to change the system. That was another thing that he did. He focused on slavery as a system, a system of interlocking laws that locked a man or a woman behind iron doors with a lock of a hundred keys, as he said, and he excoriated that system and excoriated politicians who refused to admit that it was wrong. He didn't answer every attack. There is not a single occasion on record in which he responded to a troll on Twitter, not one. <laughs> he was fiercely criticized by some of his allies and they remained his allies. Frederick Douglass, who had escaped from slavery to become a great writer and anti-slavery activist and orator, wrote in his newspaper again and again and again during the Civil War how slow and vacillating the President of the United States was to attack slavery, because Lincoln did not do it at the beginning of his administration or at the beginning of the war that had been launched by the Confederacy to uphold slavery. And despite that criticism, in 1863, Lincoln met Douglas, and they worked together as allies. He did not answer every attack. If he did answer an attack, he would make use of it to send a larger message to the larger public. Horace Greeley, a famous newspaper editor in 1862, publicly attacked Lincoln for being slow to free the enslaved laborers of Southern rebels, which he had the legal authority to do thanks to an act of Congress. He was slow, according to Horace Greeley, and he wrote this giant open letter, put it in his newspaper. Lincoln did respond in this case. He wrote an open letter of his own to Greeley, which he had published in a competing newspaper. And he said, I, if, if there's anything in your letter that is dictatorial in tone or impatient in tone, I overlook that. Even though, of course, by mentioning it, <laughs> he didn't exactly overlook it, but he went on to state his strategic purpose in the Civil War. He said it was to save the Union by the shortest means under the Constitution. He said what his goal was. And by stating his goal, he gave the rationale for the thing that only he knew he was about to do because he had already drafted the Emancipation Proclamation and was waiting for the right moment to issue that great act. One of the things that was mentioned earlier, one of the things that we all know Lincoln for, the Emancipation Proclamation. He prepared the way for the public to accept this act that not everyone, even in the purportedly anti-slavery North, was ready for or interested in. In talking with people who disagreed, or who had different points of view or different backgrounds, he focused on his own particular view of human nature, a straightforward one. He believed that people were primarily motivated by self-interest, which is a dark thought, particularly for a moral leader, but a realistic one for a political leader. I think we instinctively know that that is true. We do look after our interests. If we don't, who else is going to do it? This is even a concept in law. You may be familiar with the phrase, a statement against interest. That's when a witness says something that is not good for them. 
it's considered more credible when a witness makes a statement against interest because we're not really normally expected to speak against our own interests. So it means something when you do. Lincoln concluded that people were motivated by self-interest. And if you thought about, with empathy, thought about what their interest was in a situation, you could try to appeal to them. I mean, for example, in this situation, I guess my self-interest is that you buy this book. <laughs> hundreds and hundreds of copies of this book. But you really, you're not going to do it unless you conclude that it is in your interest to buy hundreds and hundreds of copies of, of this book. And I suppose it would be a burden on me to make it your interest to buy this book, uh, which I would like you to do, by the way, since I've now said it three times. But <laughs> what I really want to do and what I aspire to do, because I think it is more in the spirit of these talks, is talk about our shared interests as Americans and what we can learn about dealing with one another. And just now I was about to say the phrase, getting along better. But I stopped myself because that's not truly what Abraham Lincoln did, and it's not necessarily what is called for in this time of division and trouble. Many of us today are frustrated with the idea of talking with the other side, because the other side seems bananas. The other side seems to be feeding on fake news and alternative facts, uh, or wedded to an ideology or to a person that they just simply, it's, it's impossible to conceive them changing their minds. And so why would you try? Why would you subject yourself to that abuse? Why would you put yourself in that situation, particularly if you feel you're a member of a disadvantaged group, if you're a member of a minority group, if you're a person of color, if you're LGBTQ, why would you say, I want to try to understand the other side that hates me? And I think there is some value, there's some reason for that. And the answer is that sometimes everybody getting along, everybody understanding each other is too high a goal. A more modest goal, though, is achievable, and it's a goal that Lincoln went for. In these interactions, these 16 interactions with people who differed with him, he didn't necessarily change their minds. They didn't often change his mind. Sometimes they could not work together at all. The meeting was a failure, and that's just part of life and part of his life story and part of, of everybody's story of that time. But the thing to remember was that he lived in a republic, in a democracy. It was not necessary for everyone to agree on everything. It wasn't even necessary for everyone to agree on one thing. If everyone agreed, that wouldn't even be democracy. That would feel like some kind of strange totalitarian state. It would feel like 1984. What is necessary in a democracy is not for everyone to agree, but for a majority of people to agree on just enough to keep the system moving along, to do basic things like pass, a, I don't know, pass government appropriations and have a Speaker of the House of Representatives, just to name a hypothetical things, that it would be good to have a majority of people that they would be um, in, in favor of that. And if we keep that limited goal in mind, which is still very hard, I think it's achievable, and American history shows that it's achievable. You can try to build a coalition that works together on just enough to succeed. And that, I think, is what we find Lincoln doing in these 16 interactions. There are a variety of people in this book with a variety of political views. It takes us through the 1840s and 50s, before the Civil War, when slavery was legal and America was becoming more and more divided on the topic. It takes us through the 1860s, when Lincoln is president and the South started the Civil War to defend slavery. By the way, People have this debate. I know that there are people who say the South did not start the war or it did not start because of slavery. You can respond if you get into that kind of discussion by just noting a couple of facts in a very plain way without demonizing anybody. Just note that we know that the South started the Civil War because they fired the first shot. And we know that they did that in defense of slavery because they said so.
Alexander H. Stevens, who was the vice president of the Confederacy, said shortly before the beginning of hostilities that this whole principle of all men are created equal was a mistake, an error. And in fact, slavery was the proper organization of society and it was time to found a country on right principles. In this divided environment, Lincoln uh, was a politician. People were correct when they said before that he grew up poor. In fact, he had less than a year of formal education. Probably he didn't think of himself as poor. I think he would have said he was ordinary. Most people were poor. He grew up on the frontier, uh, mostly in my home state of Indiana after being born in Kentucky. When he was seven, his father uh, handed him an ax and said it's time to help clear the trees off of this farm. He wielded that ax in one way or another for the next 15, 16 years, manual labor while only rarely going to school, as I mentioned. His mother died before he was 10 years old. He had a difficult youth, more difficult than many of us can imagine, even though, as I said, again, I think it was fairly ordinary for his time. He then became a state legislator in Illinois and um, had, an interesting, had an interesting career, a talented career, had a number of frustrations after that, as was mentioned here, as was mentioned by someone over here. Uh, he didn't lose many elections, but he kept like losing the nomination or things would happen at the last moment that would frustrate him in, in different ways. Uh, and his ambitions for higher office were largely frustrated. He only served one term in Congress. He ran for Senate once and failed, and so he ran for Senate again and failed. And it was a frustrating, it was a frustrating time. But he was meeting people and finding his way toward what became the great issue of his life. And he met a number of rant, radical anti-slavery figures who are among the 16 characters in this book. Uh, one of them was Joshua Giddings of Ohio, whose faith, whose religious convictions led him to oppose slavery and who was from a northern anti-slavery area and so he could speak out in Congress. And they spoke out so fiercely against him, I th clearly thought of him as a word that I am reluctant to say in this church. Um, begins with A? <laughs> begins with A. And in any case, um, we're also on the radio here, folks, so I'm just saving a bleep for Minnesota Public Radio. They can have the bleep a little bit later on. Um, in any case, uh, his colleagues hated Giddings for constantly agitating about slavery. Lincoln was his colleague in Congress and was not constantly agitating about slavery. He was somebody who kept his mouth shut. It's interesting to think about that because Lincoln was a famous storyteller. He was a famous talker. He eventually became a great speech writer. He delivered some of the most inspiring speeches in American history, but he had a way of only saying what he wanted to say and holding back on other things. And he was not a fan of radical anti-slavery agitation, even though he was opposed to slavery and believed it was wrong all of his career and as long as he could remember. But even though they had different approaches, even though Giddings eventually was ostracized by most of his colleagues in the House of Representatives for even going against his own political party to support his anti-slavery views, he ended up working with Abraham Lincoln on a bid to abolish slavery in the District of Columbia. And it was revealing of Lincoln's style because he worked with this radical guy and he thought, now we need a conservative. And so he went to the mayor of Washington, D.C., who was a pretty conservative guy who'd been born in a slave-owning family in Virginia, uh, but was at least notionally against slavery. And so Lincoln tried to get this guy on board. And there's a moment in the meeting with the mayor, the conservative mayor, where uh, Lincoln says, you know, I've done this as a very gradual bill. It's gradual abolition. It's conservative. I think that's something that you would like as a gradual change. And I've crafted this bill because I want to appeal to people like you. I know that this will not pass unless I appeal to people like you. And the mayor says, well, this is a good bill. It's a conservative bill. In fact, it's such a conservative bill, I'm pretty sure that that radical guy, Joshua Giddings, will hate it which makes me like it. <laughs> Lincoln, sitting in the meeting, was aware that, in fact, Joshua Giddings was in favor of this bill, precisely because it would get some conservative guy like the mayor to favor it. And he decides not to tell the mayor that, in fact, Giddings likes the bill because that might make the mayor hate the bill. 
strategic silence. He worked with Owen Lovejoy, who uh, Tim mentioned earlier when he thought I wasn't listening. <laughs> I listen to everything. I'm, I'm a reporter, you see. And um, uh, Elijah Lovejoy, as mentioned, was killed for his anti-slavery views. Owen Lovejoy picked up the fight, preached for 17 years from a church in Princeton, Illinois, uh, which had a lot of people with, to say the least, mixed views of slavery. People would throw clods of dirt at him. They'd do all kinds of things, but he continued preaching. He made his house a station on the Underground Railroad. He was arrested for harboring an enslaved woman, and he went to court and did not deny doing it, but was acquitted because it could not be proven that she was enslaved. Another radical anti-slavery guy. And in 1854, he took part in founding the Illinois branch of this brand new anti-slavery party, the Republican Party of Illinois. And he invited this talented politician who hadn't been all that successful, but was well known and very well liked, Abraham Lincoln, to join the party. Lincoln thought it was too radical and declined. Owen Lovejoy and other of these early Republicans saw something in Lincoln, and in spite of him declining to join the Republican Party, they put him on the party's central committee, <laughs> which Lincoln only learned about later. Uh, but they were right. Lincoln ended up leaving his party, the Whig Party, which was falling apart in the debate over slavery, and joining the Republican Party and trying to shape a party that would be broadly inclusive of a wide variety of opinions and would succeed, would politically succeed. He was trying to build a majority coalition, and so he was working with people who had the same basic revulsion of slavery that he had, but had a different point of view about how to go about it, and they tried to work together tactically in order to succeed. And this leads to another of my 16 meetings, Abraham Lincoln, in trying to build the Republican Party of Illinois in the 1850s, came to a realization which a lot of anti-slavery people did, and that was that there were only so many anti-slavery votes in America. There was a small number of people who thought slavery was really bad, a small number of people who like literally owned slaves, and large numbers of people who would often say slavery was evil in the abstract, but they had unbelievable rationalizations for why really nothing should be done or nothing should be done right now. And Lincoln understood that in order to get a majority out of such an electorate, he needed every voter he could who was opposed to slavery, and that included people who hated immigrants. And so Lincoln made the morally perilous choice to appeal for votes among so-called know-nothings, these anti-immigrant societies who had views that Lincoln himself considered to be repulsive. But he needed their votes against slavery. And so he got a friend of his to help him campaign among the know-nothings, appeared at at least two campaign events with him, and tried to maintain a moral stance by not pandering to them at all about immigration. Lincoln actually said in a letter, if these guys ever get in power, I would rather move to a country that makes no pretense of loving liberty, such as Russia. But he spoke with them, and he made the effort in talking to people with bad views to get them to cast good votes. That's a pattern that I think is repeated throughout this book with many different kinds of people. I wanted to have the whole diversity of America reflected, or at least as much of it as I could, in 16 lives. And so there are a number of women in the book. Jessie Benton Fremont, the wife of a famous war hero, Western explorer in general who sent his wife to the White House to negotiate with the President of the United States when they had a disagreement. Mary Ellen Wise, a young woman whose story is very hard to document, but she said she was from Indiana, that she was a teenager at the beginning of the Civil War, and that she cut off her hair, put on men's clothes, and enlisted in the Union Army as a soldier, which apparently a number of women, possibly hundreds of women, did. And in 1864, she appeared at the White House and managed to get into the president's office to talk to the president and to tell him that she was having trouble collecting her back pay. 
her war record is really dubious, but Lincoln wrote her a note to take the federal paymaster saying, pay this woman, and if there turns out to be anything improper in it, I'll cover the difference myself. And then made sure that an account of this was published in the newspaper because it was an election year and women were participants in the anti-slavery movement and Lincoln was a man of the people and his sympathy for this poor farm girl from Indiana certainly made him seem like a man of the people. And also a man who wanted anybody, anybody who was willing to fight for the country, anybody. He signed the Emancipation Proclamation explicitly so that Southern laborers could be freed from bondage and brought north, and if they wanted to, they could enlist in the Union Army and add to the Union's numerical advantage. He was even willing to have women fight because he realized that what he needed, the thing that was going to win the war for the Union, was that the Union had a majority. Lincoln kept this majority coalition together when a part of the country tried to break away, and that majority, which won elections, was translated into a majority on the battlefield, which won the war. Lincoln did this in part by dealing with people who thought that he was not radical enough, like Frederick Douglass, people who thought that he was way too radical, like Duff Green, a man who tried to talk him out of the Civil War right before the Civil War. He was a slave owner who'd known Lincoln for years people who had objectionable, objectionable other views, like the, the know-nothings, people who were all over the map. Even, as we heard before, people like William Henry Seward, who is in this book, who thought, really, he should have been, he should have been president. Um, Lincoln met Seward, uh, asked him to be his secretary of state uh, before his inauguration, and handed Seward a draft of his inaugural address and said, it's kind of a gesture of respect, please take a look at this and tell me what you think, are there any changes you'd like to make? And Lincoln had done this with a number of other friends who had said, it's awesome, I love it, or I'll change a word, or I'll change, you, maybe you should cut out this phrase. And Seward took it away and went off and then wrote Lincoln a long letter. He said, thank you, this is a wonderful speech. I really love your inaugural address. There's just three things I need you to change. The beginning, the middle, and the end. And Seward was kind of that way. And Lincoln dealt with all of these people. He did not always succeed, but he always tried. And I think there are lessons here for us today, which is what has motivated me to, drive, to write this book and which I'm happy to talk about in the questions that are coming up in a moment. We live in a moment of great division and great anxiety. But I think it's a reassurance that we do not need to persuade everybody. We need to persuade a majority to move the country in the right direction. It's a more modest goal. It's a more democratic goal. It's a more achievable goal. And I would like to think that there are certain approaches to this that matter to us politically and also in our personal lives, coming back to that relative that you know, you're going to have to be dealing with in a few weeks at Thanksgiving. There are a few characteristics of Lincoln that I would like to leave you with, and one is empathy. We talked a little while ago about self-interest. Remember the part where I was urging you to buy this book? <laughs> this book. And it's a joke. But if you do buy the book, it's fine. Anyway, <laughs> empathy. Understanding how the other person sees the world. Years ago, while doing some reporting, I talked with a military officer who was talking about fighting the war in Iraq, and he said in his mind there was a difference between sympathy and empathy. He did not want to feel sympathy for the enemy, to believe the enemy was somehow morally right, but he did want empathy for the enemy. He wanted to understand what was in the enemy's mind. And that is true for military officers, even when the person is not the enemy. Maybe it's a country that we hope we never go to war with, like China. Uh, maybe it is an ordinary Iraqi that may or may not be an enemy to you. You want to empathize and understand what's going through that person's head because then you can make a correct decision on how to respond. Lincoln showed a lot of empathy. And it's a thing I think we can think about, we can consider a lot more. How does the world look to the other person's shoes? Another characteristic of Lincoln 
was patience. He waited for the right moment. That's what he was criticized for in issuing the Emancipation Proclamation. He was being slow. In one of these meetings, Frederick Douglass criticizes Lincoln for failing to get equal pay for black soldiers, and Lincoln acknowledged that this was wrong and that he was working on it. And it took him another almost a year, but he got, got that done. Patience was important, and that points to another thing with which I will conclude before taking your questions, and that is Lincoln's idea um, of the world and of change. Very little happens that is of consequence in an instant, in a moment. Change takes a long time, and I'm going to read the last couple paragraphs of this book. This is a statement against interest because I'm going to give away the ending. <laughs> I mean, I hope you buy it anyway, but if not, I'd just like you to know this. <laughs> we note here at the end the speech that I gave you at the beginning that he said that people running the slave system were not necessarily any worse than any other human beings. They were human beings who had responded to the wrong incentives, the wrong motivations. They had responded to their circumstances. And what was necessary was to change the circumstances. Lincoln said his own actions were governed by circumstances. In recounting his decision to issue the Emancipation Proclamation, he said, I claim not to have controlled events, but confess plainly that events have controlled me. In every step toward liberation, he took into account both the need to win the war and the need to maintain democratic support. But it was too modest to say that he merely responded to necessity. It was better to say that he understood the power of circumstances and tried to advance his goals within them. He spoke to the people. He knew the people he wanted to lead, and he met them as they were. He spoke of things that mattered to them, nudging just enough people just as far as they were willing to go. Eventually, the anti-slavery movement changed the circumstances. Winning a presidential election in a way that no party ever had, and then winning a second election that came in the form of civil war. At the war's end, he was killed by a man who believed that he was changing history in an instant, but Lincoln had made his impression. After his death, the states ratified the 13th Amendment, banning slavery. The 14th and 15th Amendments followed, assuring equal protection of the laws and equal voting rights. These amendments were applied unevenly at first and even less as time went on. In numerous cases, Supreme Court justices concluded that the words in those amendments did not mean what they meant. But the words remained in the Constitution to be redeemed in decades to come. Part of the circumstances for later struggles, an influence on generations not yet born. Thank you for coming this evening. The book is Differ We Must, and I will be happy to take your questions next. Thank you. you uh, have a seat? Maybe drink some water or something? Thank you, Steve Inskeep. This is the Westminster Town Hall Forum coming to you from Westminster Presbyterian Church in beautiful downtown Minneapolis. I'm Tim Hart Anderson, Senior Minister at Westminster Presbyterian Church and moderator of this forum. Our speaker today is Steve Inskeep, author of the new book, Differ We Must, How Lincoln Succeeded in a Divided America. If you're here in the sanctuary, we invite you to write a question on a card and hold it up for our ushers and they will collect them. And if you're watching online, please put your questions into the chat. We're looking for those as well. And while the ushers begin collecting questions, I'd like to thank our broadcast partner, Minnesota Public Radio. NPR will broadcast all of this, this fall's forums as a special week of programs starting December 11th. And thanks as well to our media co-sponsors, MinPost. Find more information at minpost.com and Sahan Journal. Find more information about them at sahanjournal.com. 
And now please take a moment to mark your calendars for our next two forums this fall, November 9, with Nancy Giles of CBS Sunday Mornings on humor in the American story, and then December 7th with Raquel Willis, the co-founder of the Transgender Week of Visibility. More information about all of these on our website, westminsterforum.org. For those of you here in person, Mr. Inskeep will be signing copies of his book immediately following the forum. Copies are for sale from our partners at Next Chapter Books, right outside the sanctuary to your right. Everyone's also invited to enjoy our traditional breads and spreads reception following the program. Please join us in Westminster Hall, again, out the door to your right for refreshments and continued conversation. And now, Ms. Drinskeep, if you are ready, I'll present questions from the audience. I guess I better be ready. Yeah. I, I suspect as you talk about your book, uh, you hear this question often, so let's just get it out of the way. Sure. Uh, are there any politicians today <laughs> who uh, emulate the kinds of virtues and political skill that, that Lincoln did? Yeah, I can think of a few who have quite openly and explicitly tried to model Lincoln. Barack Obama began his first presidential campaign at the... Is someone going to do a gift? Fine, applaud him. <clears throat> began his first presidential campaign at the old state capitol in Springfield, Illinois, where w Lincoln had worked as a state legislator. And I think there are conscious or unconscious patterns of behavior that you can find in the way that Obama approached issues. I'm not the first person to notice this similarity. Lincoln was, by many people's accounts, slow to issue the Emancipation Proclamation. He did it when it was military necessary, militarily necessary and also perhaps when it was politically possible. Uh, Obama was opposed to gay marriage until he wasn't um, and chose a moment to do that that felt morally right and practically right to make that statement. Um, <clears throat> President Biden is another who comes to mind who, uh, you can applaud him too, that's fine. Um, <laughs> And again, I'm not saying he is succeeding as Lincoln succeeded. That's a judgment we make day by day. But he is explicit and open about wanting to work when he can with people who hold disagreeable views. He got in trouble in his first presidential campaign by recounting times in the 1970s when he had worked with segregationists in the United States Senate to do positive things. He was fiercely criticized for that, which there it is. It's a difference of opinion about how to deal with disagreeable people. Um, and Biden has a particular approach that harkens back to this older style of politics. Um, I'm gonna say one more. <clears throat> Donald Trump is, as Lincoln was, an innovative political communicator. Uh, <laughs> Should we let him get I away mean with that? I mean that, really, actually. But, yeah. uh, I, I did want to press a little bit. The two you named, seriously, were, uh, were Democrats. Yes. Is there a Republican who comes yeah, to well, mind? Yeah, well, I mean, I, there's, there's an example that I think of. I mean, there are plenty of people who've reached across the aisle in different ways. I mean, John McCain was someone who did this a lot. Um, yeah, there you go. Uh, there, I mean... The single most famous piece of legislation that he was associated with was McCain-Feingold. Uh, Russ Feingold was considerably more liberal and more democratic than John McCain, and they worked together. I also think of a famous historical example that I think is Lincoln-esque, and it involves a Republican from Illinois. Martin Luther King, in the March on Washington in 1963, spoke against the tranquilizing drug of gradualism essentially saying, we need equality now. Don't tell me that we have to move slowly because there is political opposition. We need equality now. He was effectively doing what Frederick Douglass was doing in the 1860s. Abolish slavery now. Now is the time. Everett Dirksen was a U.S. Senator, a Republican from Illinois, who was in the United States Senate debating the Civil Rights Act, what would become the Civil Rights Act of 1964, and Dirksen was on a number of occasions, raising concerns and objections and proposing amendments to the Civil Rights Act of 1964. But what Dirksen really was doing with this political theater was 
persuading and gaining the votes of more conservative senators who they had to have in order to pass the Civil Rights Act, which Senator Dirksen always supported. He was doing the role there of Abraham Lincoln, of trying to move more conservative people along and taking political chances in order to do so. Thank you for that answer. I just should note that Liz Cheney was here at the University of Minnesota there this week. There you Another illustration. Thank you. That's an, that's an illustration of someone who crossed party lines to support the Constitution as she saw it and to support the facts as we at NPR have reported them about what happened in 2021. This question is about how Lincoln developed these skills. Did he instinctively know how to persuade people to do the right thing, or did he work to develop his skills over time? I love that question. Uh, I don't think that he instinctively understood, and there's a lot of evidence that he did work at it and he learned from a very early age. There are accounts from his boyhood, even, of him carefully watching people. His stepmother describes grown-ups coming to visit the cabin, and Lincoln, as a boy, would sit there quietly listening to the grown-ups converse. And when the visitors had left, Lincoln would begin asking his parents questions. And she said he would ask questions because he wanted to understand everything down to the smallest detail. By the time he was an adult, a man who worked with him in the Illinois State Legislature said that his mind had become a great storehouse of facts about how people lived their lives and what motivated them. Lincoln used the word motive as a synonym for self-interest. He wanted to know what people's motives were, and he would take that into account very clearly in the arguments that he would make to them, whether in speeches or one-on-one. -on -one. What do you think President Lincoln would do to address the current impasse in Congress? General Grant, no! <laughs> No, let's think about that. Lincoln didn't have a lot of experience with that. Um, in Lincoln's time, he became president of the United States, and then a number of southern states seceded or tried to secede from the Union, which meant their representatives left Congress, which meant a large part of the political opposition was out of there. And Lincoln's party suddenly had huge majorities. Um, there was a midterm election, they lost a lot of that majority, but he had a Congress that was fundamentally on his side, sometimes too much on his side. They began hunting for traitors in the administration and trying to run the war for him from time to time. It was a great frustration. Um, I don't know what Lincoln would have done exactly, but I do think that Lincoln would have understood something that uh, at least the House majority, House Republicans, seem to have missed, and that is that you need a majority in order to govern. Um, and there are three places where that seems to have gone wrong. The Republicans were greatly favored to win huge congressional majorities in 2022. They ran a particular kind of campaign that was narrower, that was what's called a base campaign. They didn't reach out for enough support and they underperformed. They did get a majority in the House of Representatives, but it was so narrow that a handful of lawmakers could blow up that majority. Speaker Kevin McCarthy was the second occasion. He did not manage to keep that majority together, although he ultimately blew it up by working with the other side to do the normal business of government, which is something that I'm not going to say it was the right thing, but let's just say it was the normal and expected thing. Um, and then the final failure of this principle was uh, Congressman Gates and other Republican lawmakers who dethroned the speaker, but they don't have a majority either. And so nobody has a plan at this time, and it's uncharted territory. In your opinion, is the intensity of political and social diversity and tension today higher or lower than that prevailing in the 40s and 50s, ooh, 1840s ooh, and 50s? Thank you, thank you. And you're talking now about before the Civil War. I think it was worse then because there was a single overriding, overpowering moral issue facing the entire country. And as I mentioned before, it was an issue on which many people attempted to have nuanced or self-contradictory positions. But really, it was about as black and white an issue as we've had in America. I mean that in terms of clarity and not any other way. Um, and it was 
a serious, serious issue. We have serious divisions today. We could talk about divisions over abortion, just to give one example. Many divisions, but we also have many divisions that it's hard to imagine fighting a civil war over because they're disputes about culture, they're disputes about style, they're disputes about how you say things, they're people being angry over the implications of what somebody else almost said in a tweet. Um, the, a lot of our arguments uh, really do feel pointless and aimless, and in a way, that pointlessness and aimlessness is hopeful because you probably don't fight a war over those things. See, you it's, wanted hope? Yeah. I got you hope. Good, thank you. Uh, are there other presidents you can think of in our history who have nudged the people forward and ended up making significant changes in American life. Oh my gosh, yes. And there is one in particular who was very mindful of the need to get a majority together, and that called for some compromise and some of the things he did that were criticized. Uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt in the 1930s. Uh, Robert Dalek has a great book about this. David Leonhardt, by the way, has a, has a much more recent book. In fact, it comes out in a couple of, of weeks uh, that talks about this same period. Dalek's book, observes that Roosevelt, having won election in 1932 in the depths of the Great Depression, went for social change, but he attempted to frame popular measures. He really didn't want to do a lot of things that were unpopular. He really didn't want to do a lot of things even if they were 51-49 issues. He wanted to win big majorities, 60-40 issues, um, and I guess that was in his self-interest because he wanted to be re-elected. It turns out he wanted to be re-elected again and again. Um, but Roosevelt's view of it was meshing that self-interest with the national interest. Democracy was under threat. Democracy had been discredited by the Great Depression. Democracy was being pressured by these competing systems, communism and fascism. Democracy needed to win big. And Roosevelt focused on popular programs. That also led him to some deep moral compromises. He got a lot of votes out of Southern segregationist senators uh, and gave up something for it, allowed a lot of federal programs to be segregated in ways that have warped society ever since. So it wasn't a 100% win, but he was following that principle of building a big coalition and getting things done. Let me ask one last question that, that refers to your work as a journalist. Sure. And not just as the historical work you've done, but you, you interview people all over the spectrum. You see a lot of the, the trouble in the world today. There's trouble in the world? Yes. Okay. Uh, you've referred to Israel and Palestine. You yes. just interviewed Zelensky. Yes. Uh, how do you as a journalist maintain your own personal sense of hope in, for the human family? Thank you. Aren't you glad that I did not answer no to that question earlier? <laughs> because we'd be heading really for a dark end. I think that part of the answer lies in my study of history. Um, and I don't mean just to say it's been worse, although it's been worse. Um, that, that's part of it. But I try. Again, you'll read or listen or whatever and tell me if I succeed, but I try to take the long view of things, which I have no doubt that you have done in your decades running this forum and in the kinds of people you've brought here. You've surely taken the long view of what is important in the long run. And when you take that long view, a lot of the news events that are disturbing become a little bit less so because you realize that, that, that certain terrible things or seemingly terrible things will pass. And then we can focus on the longer term issues that are of true importance. And in the longer term, um, we can have faith and hope in democracy. May I conclude with a quote of sorts, which doesn't sound hopeful, but I think it is. Um, Theodore Roosevelt, played once off of an old saying. It's a Latin saying, vox populi vox dei. The voice of the people is the voice of God. Politicians loved this saying, the voice of the people is the voice of God, because it accounted for the uncertainty of elections and a lot of other things. Roosevelt, though, once, when his party was on the way to, the Republican Party was on the way to nominating a corrupt candidate for president, when has that ever happened? But, but, 
the Republican Party was on the, he, he was a Republican, he was a great Republican president. His, his party was on the way to nominating a corrupt candidate for president, and Roosevelt couldn't believe it. And he said, the voice of the people may be the voice of God in 51 cases out of 100, <laughs> but in the other 49, it's the voice of the devil or of a fool. I acknowledge that. I acknowledge the imperfections of democracy, but what makes me hopeful is I hold on to that 51%. Thank you, Steve Inskey. Thank you. Mr. Inskeep wanted me to remind you that he's selling books tonight. <laughs> Out the door to your right, he'll autograph them for you. Those of you who park downstairs, uh, your cars need to be on their way out at 8.30. 8.30, which is an hour and a half from now, so don't run out to go have dinner, and we'll be glad to keep your car overnight, but 8.30, cars out of the garage, and there's breads and spreads over here, and thank you for being here tonight. Keep coming to the forum. It's been wonderful to be with you all these years.